Can you can be here. Where you Good evening, everyone. Oh, hi. Test? No. No. Okay, I'm starting for real this time. Sorry, thank you. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are we live, work, and learn on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Sinaiq people and honor their ongoing presence and care for this land. I'd like to welcome everyone this public consultation meeting with the Board of Education for SB10. I'd like to begin with a few introductions. Tonight we have three trustees from the Board of Education. Myself, Christy Dixon. To my right is Daniel Simon. And the far, far right is Laura Lee Brecky. Trustee Steve Gascon and Rhonda Farrell send their regrets. We also have three members of our senior staff present. Patrick Martin, IT manager, who's been working really hard to get the system going. Peter Dubinsky, assistant superintendent and incumbent superintendent secretary treasurer. And Terry Taylor, superintendent and secretary treasurer. From Stella Jones, we have two guests, Dave Eddy and Patrick McMicken. Our moderator for this evening is Paul Peterson, a longtime Burton resident, former trustee for the Board of Education of SD10, and our current RDCK director. And last but not least, members of the public are joining us both virtually through Zoom and in here in person at the Burton School. We look forward to hearing from you this evening as the board and our public hear from Stella Jones regarding their proposal to access their forest tenure on Crown land through a segment of Burton School property. As you will see and hear in more detail this evening, Stella Jones has approached the school district to construct a road adjoining Ruby Ridge Road, which would run through the southeast of the 64 acres of Burton School property. The road access proposal was brought forward to the board by Stella Jones in order to access fur beetle infested timber on the forest tenured crown land above and on Ruby Ridge. It is important to clarify why the board has engaged in public consultation this evening. School district property is public property. Community interest regarding potential road access should be considered. Transparency in this matter was seen as important by the board and a public consultation was decided by the board to be in the best interest of the school district. Under legislation, boards of education are required to consult with the public when an agreement for a lease of more than 10 years is considered on school district property. A record and documentation of that consultation must be available and provided to the ministry if an agreement granting road access is approved by the board. Finally, this engagement with public is part of the board's role as governors of the school district. It's also important to clarify what is not on the table. The meeting is about potential road access to school district property only. This is not a meeting about whether Stella Jones should log in their tenured land area or not. The Board of Education has no purview in that regard. Moderator Paul Peterson will keep the meeting on track to this regard and ensure that the consultation this evening remains about road access. Though we anticipate that the public may have questions about the proposed logging plan, the scope of the board consultation meeting this evening is to gather public input on whether or not the board should consider granting access to create the road on the Burton School property. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Peterson, who has graciously agreed to moderate tonight's meeting. Paul will take questions both from the floor and from chat and Zoom. We will then begin the meeting with a short presentation from Dave Eddy and Pat Kekin. So, Paul Peterson.
Is that better? Yeah. Right. We're good. Start okay. That's okay. Uh, my name is Dave Eddy. Dave Eddy. Do I have to look into here to get hello out there? <laughs> I'm a uh, forest professional with Stella Jones, uh, based out of Salmon Arm. Uh, Pat McMacken. We've, we've been asked to look into the camera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stella Jones uh, manages a forest license in around Burton area in the Caribou Creek area. Uh, the forest license, uh, our responsibility is to manage the forest and the roads. Uh, we have uh, the, the rights to harvest timber according to the laws and such. Uh, tonight, um, we're here to talk about a proposal that we made to the school district. Uh, proposal to cross land to to build a road and cross land to access crown land that's right beside it right and behind it uh, on that crown land there is some bark beetle damaged timber that we want to try to salvage and try to remove the beetles from the area um, so my presentation tonight uh, i'm going to explain a bit on why we're why we're doing the logging here why we want to cross the, the, the school district land i want to describe how i've got to this point today where we are through last year's development through the spring and into into now um, describe why some changes were made this spring i've talked to a few people in the community about some changes we've made want to outline our current harvest plan and um, why we still need access why we're still requesting access across the the, the crown land or the school district lands um, i've had questions about hydrology and terrain stability so I, i'll present to you some of the findings of our reports from the, from those experts and um, then I'll, I'll, I'll share our proposal that we've made to the school district on, on, on the lands and then answer some questions at the end if there are any. Okay. Hopefully these are set up. So this is a photo uh, taken last year on Highway 6 north. Uh, you all recognize it probably, head north into Burton. And that's uh, Ruby Ridge or uh, Scalping Knife, I believe local name and um, this right here is about where the school district property lies in that general area um, uh, ruby ridge road existing road runs across through here and this is all our forest land area it's all crown well it's not all crown land it's private land lower but this is the crown land uh, that our forest license is on This is a photo I took last spring of the same area. This is taken, I think, from the boat launch. And the red circles are, uh, if, if you could see it clearly on the photo, the red circles are actually red trees on the hillside that depict dying timber. Um, and that's what attracted me to the area as a potential bark beetle problem. Again, the green shape is my guesstimate of where the school district land is there, my estimate. So, um, you know, we're looking at all these areas, but tonight we want to talk about these two areas and you can see how steep the land is again the Ruby Road. Uh, maybe I can draw a line through here. The existing Ruby Road kind of does this. Um, so, and you can see how steep that terrain is getting up into those areas is challenging. Um, lots of rock bluffs. Lots well, of steep broken ground. Coming across through the school district land was one of the options I looked at. So my original plan, this is more of a plan view look from above. Um, those red areas that we saw back on the previous slide have turned into this shape. This is what we call block 80. This is the school district property down here, this rectangle, and there's a school right down here. This is the power line. And there's the Ruby Road, the existing forest road that runs up through there. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, can you move forward? No, I want you to be able to see it. Yep. I'm not sure, honestly. So I've, I've put some text boxes in here with pointers. So this one up here points to the Ruby Road. Okay, and the school's down there.
Okay, thanks. So I wanted this uh, slide, it helps show where, uh, I'll move over here for now, I guess. It shows where everything is in relation. So again, this is the Ruby Road through here. This is the school district 10 lands. And there's Burton Elementary School where we are right now. This is the hydro line that you probably recognize on the hillside above us. Uh, in the previous slide, I showed those red circles where the bark beetle was. This is the main one you see is in here and, and down in here. Those are the main two circles I had. In and around throughout that whole purple area is, it, it is full of bark beetle. It's predominantly Douglas fir uh, timber type. And um, this is how the shape has come out for a logical, safe unit to harvest. So this was uh, back in January, November, December, January, when I first started talking with the school district, this was the shape I had. And this road access in through here is what we call the, ST, the SD10 road. And that's what we're proposing to cross. It's a couple hundred meters within the property. And then it gets onto crown land. And our logging operation would have a landing here. This, this red is a trail where we would cable harvest the steep ground and then forward the wood down to here to put on trucks and then haul it out. So that was, uh, that was our proposal last, last fall and through the winter. And then as we kept discussing things into the spring, uh, there was some changes that were made. And some of the changes occurred because the Ministry of Forest asked me about uh, a more total chance plan of where our roads might go. Uh, how to respond quicker to other beetle outbreaks. Um, and they also discussed a little bit about visual concerns. So basically in the end, they asked me, can I improve my blocks and roads for longer term planning? So uh, I looked at another road option. Uh, also during that time, I found that there was more beetle. Uh, outside that area, I found more bark beetle in the timber. And then uh, we also decided that we'd consult with an expert regarding wildfire behavior um, in this area, the history, and uh, how bark beetle infested timber might affect the wildfire behavior. So that's what I was doing this spring. In regards to this uh, proposal, uh, is that gonna stay highlighted? I guess so. Um, regarding this proposal and school district 10, I do have a road coming in from the north. I'll show you on a map next slide, but it does provide longer term access to the top of block 80. It's a more logical road location for, for that hillside and addressing future beetle issues if any do occur. Um, it does provide a good control point and access for wildfire fighting crews. If there is a wildfire on the hillside, it could prevent fire from private land going or help them prevent fire moving up or down the hill. Um, it does reduce the amount of timber to be hauled across the school district land. And that uh, is a consideration later, I guess. And uh, that's regarding the new road that I put in this spring and then uh, the block itself did get bigger. I found more beetle to the north and south of that original shape I showed you. Uh, the block does remove beetle killed timber. So hopefully that reduces wildfire spread rates after. Um, the Southern area that I've added does require cable harvesting and it's, it, I only know one logical solution to take it up to the end of that SD10 road that I'm proposing. Um, the, the area now will take all the available timber that'll come to the SD10 road. And that's important because it's basically a one shot, one time entry on that road. We can go in, harvest all the, all the available fur that's attacked, and then we can have silviculture completed, planting a free to grow forest. We can uh, deactivate that road and remove that access. So it's, it's a better plan in, in quite a few ways, I think. So I mentioned I, uh, mentioned I got an expert um, to consider, um, to help me understand wildfire risk and, and beetle attack timber and, and stuff like that. So we, we hired foresight consultants and John is a professional forester who's a, who's a fire specialist. And we asked him to consider whether the fire, wildfire risk considerations for harvesting along Ruby Road, that's what the title is. And um, the objective was to discuss and inform stakeholders of the proposed units. The units are our cut blocks and roads. 
and the influence that that development will have on wildfire behavior and wildfire risk in the area. There's a lot of technical jargon in here I'm just going to pass over. Um, I can go through it more later if we have questions. Uh, John's found that when he looked at the polygons, the different timber types and areas, there is moderate and high risk polygons in this area. The risk in relation to uh, wildfire, threat of wildfire. And then, sorry, he does point out here, reminds us of wildfires of the past uh, in the area. And I think this uh, second to last one in 2003, I think that's the large unit across the lake that was probably a pretty frightening experience. And behind this here as well. And behind, okay, thanks. Um, John talks in here about forest health concerns and he talks about how Douglas fir bark beetle can damage and kill trees and that those dead and dying trees dry out and um, they can exhibit increased wildfire intensity. This comment right, whoops. Uh oh, increased wildfire intensity. Uh, so that makes sense. A stand of dry firewood is going to burn a lot, a lot hotter and faster, probably. So that's a serious concern. Um, John had a look at our plans and he thought that our activities would remove fuel from the land base. And depending on the fire spread direction may hinder the spread of wildfire. Uh, because the fuel continuity on the slope will be reduced. So we go from stands to plantation to stands. And those young plantations uh, don't burn the same as the, the old trees, the, the mature timber and the dying timber. Um, and uh, furthermore, the proposed units around Ruby Road would help establish potential anchor points and access that could be used by the BC Wildfire Service in the event of a large wildfire approaching the community. Uh, he mentions that the effectiveness of the proposed harvest area as a fuel break could further be developed into a more substantial fuel break over time if harvesting was to occur at different elevations within the area of interest. So what he's saying is if you spread some cut blocks out across the hillside, it's, it, the, the wildfire wouldn't move as fast or as seriously through the stand. Um, and then there's just a map of our, these are the area, and here's block 80, and the school board's right there. School. So that's the wildfire report, and it, it basically, in summary, it says that dying trees burn faster, and that uh, creating some fuel breaks by changing the fuel types could be a good idea. So here's the new plan. In regards to, here's again, this uh, orange rectangle is the school district property. Uh, there's the school, there's the power line. Uh, this is block 80 and it's expanded down here and it's expanded up a little bit to the north. Um, the road is still needed because this area down here uh, needs to come down to this area because of the slopes, this, the broken steep terrain. Uh, that's how that can be safely harvested. Now the road comes in from the north. We found a new road location that's a good spot and so all this timber up here can be logged to that road and taken north. It would haul back around and down the Ruby Road. And then I believe I have the same in that sort of photograph vision view, which some people prefer. So again, there's the school, the school district property. The pink on the side is what I was going to do was just sort of drag this over and do this. And that's the area that, you know, I can't access from anywhere else without that road through the school district property. Because of this super steep terrain, like that's rock bluffs, right? Uh, those cliffs. Um, that wood has to be using an overhead cable system and, and, and hauled up to the end of the road. And then this would, same thing would come down. It's, it's isolated. Otherwise, if we don't have that, that road access. Uh, okay, so the road comes in right here. This is the school 10 road. I'll move that blob. So in red here, this is the school 10, the school SD 10 road. And this yellow off the end is, is a temporary trail where the, uh, the tower, the cable yarder would, would sit on. 
And so this wood would be using an overhead system dragged up and down and then skid to a landing and then hauled out. within the safety rule, but um, you can probably see some of it from lower slopes, maybe. I don't know. We can arrange something. <laughs> I'll leave that to Pat. Something that you would like to do, we can make it happen. Yeah, we can. Are we up and running? Right from the beginning, eh, Chris? <laughs> We're good to go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I think it cut out as I was bringing this across to here. Is that correct? Maybe I was told. So this represents the area of this block that still has to be. Um, down and across the SD10 road and across the school district property. Uh, that's because of the very steep broken slopes uh, and the harvest systems that are required to, to, to harvest that area safely. Um, so yeah, this, for those that didn't see, this is the SD10 road that's still proposed in the same spot. And it would switch back onto the existing Ruby road where the trucks would, and logging crews would access. This yellow is a, is a yarder road. It's a temporary trail where the tower, the yarder machine would sit and it would use overhead systems to drag the wood up and down. So that's the current plan. Um, uh, what slide is that? Number eight, so we're going to nine. So whenever, well, let me go back to that slide. So uh, in forestry, whenever we have cut blocks and roads, adjacent private lands, near uh, domestic water use, anything like that, we hire experts to give us professional opinions, to look at our plans and give us feedback and commentary on, on um, things to consider. They recommend um, plans, maybe some changes sometimes. So with this, with this project, um, just to let you know, these red circles are water intakes. Um, the blue are some sort of water course. 
And then of course, this is private land. So as you can see, there's a little bit of uh, risk, if you will. So we try to mitigate that, minimize it, eliminate it wherever we can. So I hired a hydrologist, Mike Mill, and this is I've taken from his email and it, his email talks to my whole project and it's not all pertinent to the SD10 land. So I just, I took out the bits that are pertinent to the SD10 land. Uh, Mike, for the, for the whole permit, um, has very limited concern with how any of our activities will affect water in regards to the volume and timing of, of flow. So he doesn't think that where we're logging, how we're logging, how much we're logging will affect how much water flows seasonally. Uh, he doesn't think it'll affect any of the peak, peak flows or any of those kind of concerns that they shouldn't dry up in the summer because of our logging. It's not that much area that we're impacting. So he has very little effect uh, concern to that. He did caution me though that sediment could be delivered down to intakes where, uh, where the streams are. So he suggests some things to consider. So what I've done is I've, this again is across the whole um, comments that are uh, to the whole project. And I'm just gonna talk now to the SD10 land, but um, I've underlined some, some of the highlights uh, and I've lettered them so to address each of them down below. So he talks about sediment being generated perhaps from systems with downstream water intakes. With systems, he's talking about streams or water courses. Um, he worries, uh, he considers that sediment can be delivered uh, when we're trying to upgrade and haul under, uh, upgrade roads, build roads or haul. And we should try to do that in dry or frozen conditions. Makes sense, don't do it when it's muddy. Uh, and he says we should apply some shutdown guidelines, letter C there. So for this project, there are two uh, intermittent non-classified drainages, but they are water courses that flow down. They are not connected to any water intakes. Um, so uh, there's very low risk to those intakes, to, to any intakes in regards to the stream flow, surface stream flow. Uh, we are gonna pr propose our row construction if we can get permits in time for fall and winter, uh, this fall and this winter harvesting in dry and frozen conditions. Um, we'd like to try to finish, haul, uh, finish logging before the next beetle flight next spring if we can. And for sh from shutdown perspective, uh, when we were doing road maintenance this spring, we did initiate shutdown. Uh, we had some spring rains, uh, was it early June, late May, or early June, I think there was some rains and we did, the, the crews did shut down for a day or two because it was uh, the appropriate thing to do. And we will apply the same strategies to our road construction logging. The hydrologist also suggests that sediment can be generated by road washout slides and erosion events that could result from culvert failure, diversions of flow. Um, so with regards to road washout slides or erosion events, we have hired a geotechnical expert and we have walked the area, all our roads and cut blocks. We've done it twice. I'll show you their feedback. Is this still on? Hello? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the, uh, the engineers uh, indicate that there's a very low to low risk of any landslide resulting from our, from our proposal. And the geotechnical review did uh, approve uh, all our culvert placements along the SD10 road. So uh, I'm gonna go back to that previous map just to show uh, what I was talking about there. So we talked about streams. There is a water intake down here, but it, I understand it's not on a stream. The stream is not connected. Uh, there are no other streams that we impact. Um, and then this road here, these are culvert locations that the geo, the engineer and geotech expert have suggested we put in just so that we don't cause any diversions of any big rain event or anything like that. So fairly well thought out. There's a very, very dry hill. There's two, two non-classified drainages, water courses that come together and then they just go underground and disappear. I was there this morning and there's, there's no water in the culvert. There's no sign of a channel. Um, 
there is a water course there, water flows subsurface, but from a sediment delivery perspective, it's a very, very low risk of delivering sediment downhill. Uh, geotech experts. So I did do this twice. I had in November of 2020, I had an engineer come up and we walked that block 80 and the SD10 road. Um, we went through that. You can see he proposed one more culvert than I didn't have. So that was good. My original proposal had that big long skid trail coming down from the top. Uh, that's what this crossed out area refers to. So I've crossed it out because we don't have that trail anymore. It's not applicable. And down to the chase there, the residual likelihood of a hazardous landslide in block 01, A01080 was estimated to be very low to low. And he's included the road in that summary as well. It's a very low risk of a landslide occurring. And because I added some areas to the block, I had the geotech out again. And this is the report from June 30th of this year, uh, the cut block name is wrong. It's still draft report, it's not a final. <laughs> but his recommendation again, uh, there are no additional recommendations. And again, he suggests that he sees a, a low risk of any landslide occurring, a low. So that's good. So that's our expert review that we had done. Um, so the proposal at the end is that we still are requesting access across the lands of the SD10 road. Um, and the proposal in the bottom there, this is what we're proposing is that, um, I'll just move it back up, sorry folks. So there is timber along the road that we would have to harvest it right away to put the road in. That timber is owned by the landowner. We'd have to get a timber mark, but that's the school district 10's timber mark and that wood is owned by them. So we could sell that and proceeds could go to the school district 10 uh, for sale of the logs. So that would go to the school district. Of course, it's their wood. Uh, Stella Jones is, has offered a payment to the school district under a road use agreement uh, that would be applied to all of the wood that is hauled down the school district road. And that's what that highlighted area is again. I've made some estimates. They're just my estimates. Sorry, there's about 200 cubic meters of timber on the right of way, about four truckloads, and maybe about 25, 30 truckloads in that area uh, from the Crown land. Uh, we're asking for a 10 year term. A 10 year term allows us to, uh, uh, from the time it's signed, to get our permits, to get the road built, to finish the logging, to do any site prep, um, take care of any fire hazard reduction work. Um, and then monitor the plantation uh, to make sure it gets to free to grow. At the end of the 10 year term or before the 10 year term, we propose deactivating the road. Um, uh, well, things typically take, uh, you're a silviculture guy more than me, but uh, between seven and 14 years to get to free to grow typically. I think 10 is a pretty good right in the middle of that. Um, gives us some flexibility. If there's a failure on the plantation, we can get in there and and and, and work that again. Dave, uh, do you prefer to take these questions now, or would you prefer to finish your presentation? I'd prefer later. That's that's fine, Paul. Okay. If, I think that was what we asked. Sorry. Thank you. Ah. Uh, and I think I missed point four that uh, we would be responsible for building the road and maintaining the road to a safe, uh, environmentally sound standard. To, uh, that would be our responsibility. The land remains owned by the SD10 board, of course. Uh, we have an access agreement to, to build and use it and cross for 10 years. So that's our proposal. And that's why we're asking for it is to harvest the beetle killed timber that we don't think we can get any other way. And in the end, I just got this this morning. Um, this is what we think it's gonna look like. So um, that's that same photo I had before and we've done some computer simulation of, of the shapes and areas. So I need to do a visual impact assessment. And this is block 80 right here. The blue hash is the, is the school district grounds. The purple is owned by BC Hydro and all the black is other private owned by individuals. 
the red areas are my other cut blocks I've proposed scattered across the hillside to pick up some of those other red patches I showed earlier. And the green lines represent uh, what we call our visual quality objective polygons in this scenic area. So trying to make a shape that's not too, um, too square, I guess. So that's, that's my presentation. Thanks, Dave. Okay, we're going to take questions. Uh, just remember the topic is whether to give access to Stellar Jones to basically the only topic on the table. And please be respectful no matter how you feel about the bottom, be respectful. And, uh, Start off with the questions, but, and I, I appreciate if you're raising your hand so that we don't have four people talking at the same time. Would somebody like to start? So maybe I'll just jump oh, in. I turn this thing on. Oh. And maybe all of the agents out there are people on Zoom who have questions as well, and so um, we, we want to make sure today have an opportunity to be able to hear any questions. <laughs> So, hi, <laughs> if you have a question, just so that the people on Zoom can hear, this is the microphone. So if you wouldn't mind, if you have a question, maybe just raise your hand and Paul will recognize you. And if you just come up here um, and stand here and just ask your question in that way, it, they can hear you at home. We have no video here. Okay, hold on. And Peter, so I a question, I should turn my mic off, is that correct? You should turn it off. Uh, I'm not used to this kind of technology. Yes. It would be so great, we don't have to deal with Zoom anymore. Nice. Do you think it will go away? Yeah, probably. Oh, all that. Zoom? Yeah. From home's kind of got oh, a place, right. except for my cats. We got intimidated because we have to stand in front of it. Otherwise, we'd have questions on us. Shelly, I was going to wear my mask like this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. We're good. Yes, you would like to stand up. Yeah, so you just grab one. Um. I just had a, a quick question about the deactivation of the road. Um, you talked about the road providing access for firefighters in case of a fire on the hill. Um, and then, but then if you deactivate the road, oh. Okay, no, it's... <laughs> You want to try this one? If you deactivate the road, does that destroy the access for the firefighters? That's a good question. Um, are we live or do we know? Okay, so the question was, uh, I mentioned we're going to deactivate the road, but that if we deactivate it, how would it still provide access for firefighters, I believe is the question. So what we're going to deactivate is this road. Uh, by deactivating and just pulling out the culverts, there's basically still a road base there. Uh, they would, equipment could quickly replace those culverts and get access within hours. So uh, it's fairly quick. This road, however, this new proposed road, the 2020 road that we call it, this is what this hash line is coming down here. That road will stay in. It as well will provide excellent access and it goes up for approximately a kilometer to the north before it comes back to the Ruby Road. So there's, it's a, it's a really good anchor point for access adjacent to all the private land, you know, right between the private land and the crown land. So it's a, it's a pretty good location for wildfire fighting. Uh, from a wildfire fighting perspective, this distance isn't that great. Um, crews could move through there quite quickly. But uh, so, I don't think that pulling that out, 
reduces the access terribly for wildfire fighting. If the uh, school district per prefers it in, we could leave it in and not deactivate it, but um, that's up to them, I guess, on their land. And our proposal. Go ahead, yeah. Our proposal is that it would be in for 10 years as, as, as it is currently, or as uh, the full access for 10 years. Does that help you answer the question? You feel okay? With forest roads, we're required to maintain them until they're deactivated for safety and environment. So by deactivating the road, pulling the culverts out, we reduce our liability for the long term of any public uh, issues on that road or any environmental issues if something was to occur. So fully deactivating the road reduces the risk of the public going up there, uh, causing some grief in behind the, and adjacent to private land as well. So I think there's a good reason to reduce access uh, through the private land. We'll zoom in there. Patrick, how about now? All right. So this question is from the Valley Voice. And the question is, at today's values, what would the rough value be of the school district logs and the road use agreement? So Dave, if you could respond to that, that would be helpful. Uh, today's values. Uh, Pat might have better knowledge of today's values, but it's... Um, we're talking about the timber sales and the road use agreement. Uh, you're doing some quick math for me, Pat. Thanks, as I stumble here. Um, 200 meters of timber. Uh, yeah, about four loads of logs. 20 ish grand. About $20,000 worth of net yeah. value uh, on that wood. And the road use agreement is in around two to three thousand, three thousand dollars somewhere around there for the crossing the land. It's based on the, uh, those are estimates of timber based on market values and what actually gets hauled, I don't know. So it's a guess, but it's somewhere in that range. So are you saying that the district will get um, money for every load that comes out that travels on their land or just for the 200 cubes that is actually standing on their land? Uh, the 200 cubic meters on the land is their wood. So the sale of that, the proceeds, less the logging costs would go to the school district. That's right. So, so the value of the access is that do you do you pay like if you haul i don't know 200 loads i have no idea but mm -hmm. say you haul 200 loads on that stretch of road do you give something more if you haul 200 and less if you haul 100 loads or is it just a flat rate uh or any it's controlled the, the rates are approved by the government when we uh, apply our cutting permit and they typically want them as a cubic meter rate so by the cubic meter. Uh, so it would be uh, a rate based on, uh, would be a rate per cubic meter for all the logs, all the crown wood that comes down the SD10 road. I see, okay. Does that answer? And that's the $3,000 that you were talking I'm about. I'm estimating around $3,000, yeah. Okay. yeah. Sounds good, thank you. When I mentioned it earlier in the slide, how the road from the north affected the SD10 land, the original agreement had all this wood coming down there. Um, and that of course would be a higher return to the school district. But for those reasons, for better access, better wildfire control, it's addressing all the beetle concerns. It makes much more sense to have that road up there, but it means less wood to come down the SD10 road. So mine is the water source. 
And it's a spring. Are you Alice? No, I'm Brenda. Brenda, sorry. Oh, on the school district land yes. here. Yeah, okay. Sorry, and I thought you meant I one. have a concern. Am I going to have an issue with my water mm -hmm. um, because you're right above me? Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned that because we don't really know for sure where my spring comes from. It's mm -hmm. in the mountain as far as my arm can reach in a hole. Mm -hmm. That's where the spring is. And um, you mentioned that there was water. Um, there was water up above and it went into the ground and came down. Mm -hmm. That could be the source of my, part of the source of my spring. I don't want, I, I don't, you can log all you want. I don't want the road. That's okay. all. Um, I, I, I'm just, it's my only water source and I can't risk losing my water source just for a company to get some money. And that water source has been in our family for over 120 years. And I just don't want to, I just don't, period. I don't want to lose it. That, that, so, you know. Understandable. That's, that's all. And for I don't sure. have access to any other water. I'm yeah. outside of the Burton system. So. Did you, yeah. That's, I'm the red dot right behind the school. Yeah, L. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Nice to see you. Um, we talked on the phone a while back. That's why we hired a hydrologist and uh, without x-ray vision, we don't know exactly where that water comes from and it does percolate. He does refer to that in his report, it percolates in ground and that's, that's why the hydrologist feels there's gonna be no effect, very, what was his words? Very low to very low effect on the quantity. This hillside generally is a ridge. I probably hit the button again because I got to hold it like this, not touch the. Sure, where this water comes from. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't. Very Did you get any of that? Uh, it probably came from the other mic. <laughs> I didn't touch the button, I swear. Sorry. <laughs> Can, uh, can you tell us how you found the existing water sources? Because I don't think mine's on a map anywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's lots of people that just go up there and put a pipe in the, in the creek or whatever. So how did you go about finding these uh, sources of, of water for the uh, residents? I don't have that map with me. Good question. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so the, there is government data that maps uh, water intakes, the licensed intakes. Um, Stella Jones, Bell Pole, years ago when, when they uh, built, I guess, the Ruby Road before my time, spent a lot of time on this hillside uh, with, lo with residents at that time, um, visiting and mapping all the water intakes at that time. And we, we ran lines up every, every stream, every water course from the bottom to the top. Um, we actually tight changed all of them with compass and mapped them all out. So that's the historical data I have. I've been trying to contact uh, many of the local residents um, on the main systems that I, that I think we may have um, more impact on than others, if you will, right? The ones where we might cross or where logging is adjacent and it's directly connected to, to an intake. 
and, and I've met with several people here to, to go look at their water intakes. So um, I would be more than happy, please, to let me, let me know where your water intake is, and, and I, I want to know where it is. I want to know who you are and your phone number so I can phone you if, if anything occurs or when we're planning to log. I want to notify people um, before. So does that help answer your question? down if I'm a little bit too off topic. Um, did you notice much of the beetle damage being done to the logs on the property, on the SD property? I did walk there when I was first talking and Hugh Watt from NAC4 was helping the school district understand, the board understand some of what we we're talking about. And he asked me to have a look because um, he was concerned. There is some red trees up in the area. So I only walked down, I've walked this many times up and down. Uh, there is some beetle right in here, right adjacent. We have beetle right to there. So uh, I'm gonna assume that there is beetle right there at the top of the property. Um, there's a bunch of dead wood in here that I think is from lodgepole pine years ago. There's some dead standing and dead down. Um, but really through there, I, I don't recall, um, but that was last year before this year's flight. I don't recall any beetle. It's just above my head a little, but I'm just curious if um, like SD should be doing any kind of um, work to remedy their property before it becomes a problem. Uh, that's, yeah, go ahead, Pat. Well, it's not for us to make that decision, but if the school district decides that they would like to do that, um, Stella Jones would be very happy to help them out uh, with that, but that's not for, for uh, us to do. Yes. We provide those, we would provide those services for more. There would be some economic benefit to using a logger that's already there. You wouldn't have to pay for transportation, mobilization and, and such, but anyways. Another topic, another discussion, I guess. And I've been with the district for 22.8 years. And when I was with the district, they logged this here area to build this school. And they didn't get to, you remember Paul, right? You were still trustee then. Still yeah, I know, mine's half gone. Anyways, um, they had to fight. The secretary treasurer had to fight to get any of the money back. They had to submit it to the government and they don't get 100% of the money. I don't know why, it may be different now. It might be something, because that's a while ago, uh, 95, 96, I think the school might have opened. But yeah, they he fought long and hard, the secretary treasurer to get, money back and they didn't get 100% back. So I would hope, because it's not a bunch of money, but the district doesn't make a whole bunch of money out of it if it's the same way as it used to be. That's just my brain remembering stuff. So I'm just curious, because um, this is new for me, like how do you guys decide that this is the spot of crown land that you want? Is basically, did the beetles come first or did you guys, you know, have, hey, we got a log, you know, this is coming up, there's blank space on the calendar. Like, how does that go down, first of all? Just, um, did you go scouting around or was it like, oh no, there's an infestation, there's a problem. Hey, Stella, are you looking for work, blah, blah, blah. Because I understand that you guys need work and I totally respect that. I also know that there's a lot of concern here about the school, about the road, blah, 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 right? So I'm kind of trying to see a way to kind of merge both things together. So I just, I'm curious. 
That's a good question. So uh, our forest license uh, covers a large area than, and we're responsible as foresters and, and, the, and the company to, to manage the area for forest stewardship for all, all the values, recreation, uh, water, fish, biodiversity, et cetera. So right. um, in doing that, we, we look at the whole land base and, and um, come up with plans on how we think we can best do that. Uh, we're allowed to harvest so many cubic meters of timber a year on that land base decided by uh, the government. That's our annual allowable cut. Um, right. Last spring, last, uh, last spring, when I was working up here on another project, I noticed the red trees on the hill. Um, at that time, if any of you can remember, it was a little bit challenging to get up the Ruby Road, but uh, we did work our way in there and uh, we did do some flights with drones. Um, and then we noticed those red patches. So um, the red, as I know, is a beetle. It's dying trees. When they're in patches like that, I know from experience, it's, it's beetle trees occurring all around right southern away. BC. It, yeah. it's, it's an issue. It was a lodgepole pine uh, uh, bark beetle before, and, and now Douglas fir bark beetle. So sure. we would rather... Uh, it's good for our business to salvage these tr these trees to use this timber while it's uh, while it still has value to prevent it from spreading and killing other trees so it's good business to try to salvage this to try to get rid of the beetle in the long term because the remaining forest around it will stay healthy longer um, does nature ever cure itself with this beetle situation uh yeah not always in ways that we like uh necessarily as humans and um, the lodgepole pine, the mountain pine beetle, for instance, destroyed hundreds of thousands, millions of hectares of, of forest across the province. A lot of it burnt in the last few years. Um, so yeah, basically these things go in cycles. These trees are um, 120, 130 years old. And as we get older, we tend to get sick sometimes and same as trees, they're less, less able to fight off the beetle. Um, and then the beetles are always there in endemic small amounts. But when we have periods of drought or when um, which we've had, the trees are more prone to attack. Uh, the beetle are successful. They breed up into huge numbers. You can hear them flying in the forest. It's, it's pretty crazy, actually, mm -hmm. that little mm -hmm. tiny animal. Totally. I, I emptied our traps today and I got a peanut butter jar full of beetles from mm -hmm. the traps. Um, 1.3 liters, I think, total is 1.5 liters of beetle that I trapped in those areas. So, and they tell me, the experts tell me that if I trap 1,200 beetles, I save a tree. So, I, I don't know how many trees I saved today, but <laughs> each, uh, each two of those beetles would make 20 or 30 other ones, right? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy how fast it grows. Okay, and I wasn't here for introductions. Are you forestry in your Stella? Is this what's happening? We're forestry for Okay. So you do work for Stella, even though you're forestry. Uh, well, we're professional Forest foresters. Forsters. Thank you. We're professional foresters registered with the Association of BC Forest Professionals. Okay. That's our governing body, and we work for Stella Jones. That's our employer. Cool. Okay, last thing. Um, <laughs> you want to comment to that question? I can, so, I can add after it. Okay. That little uh, bubble of red that you had pulled off to say, you know, these are untouchable without that road. Oh, uh, yes. Is there not a middle ground where people can get what they want, you get what you want, and maybe you just leave that part alone? Is that, is that a thing that could go down? I'm uh, serious, because like, that's like a small- Yeah, that's about- you know, When you consider all of that, like, do you need all of that? Do we need to touch that? Are we really worried about the beetles? Like what's going on? So, yeah, so my, my job is to, um, is to try to manage these forest health concerns. And there is active bark beetle in there that will spread to other forests. So, um, and, and that is uh, why we're, we're trying to, uh, to make a plan to harvest that. I'm sorry? Well, <clears throat> just to, my original plan, if you can see that, doesn't have that area in there because last fall when I was there, there wasn't any beetle in there. And now there is. Um, so that's why it's in the plan now. It is about the beetles. It's about trying to stop that spread and, and we call it sanitation. If you can harvest it while the beetles are in it or salvage when the beetles are gone and just.
Yeah, that's right. And, and, but it, you need to note that this is all for, so if we don't address the beetle situation, it's going to spread beyond that. It's not just going to stay in, the, in this patch and, and, and be done. I just wanted to add one more thing to uh, Dave's comment about um, how we knew that there was beetle there. So he, he mentioned the drone flights. The ministry also flies uh, once or twice a year with uh, planes and they map all the forest health concerns. They send all that information to all the licensees and ask that we uh, address it. Um, and I'm gonna toot our own horn here a little bit. Um, and that is that um, they regularly comment that Stella Jones deals with their forest health concerns. And that's what we're trying to do again here. So uh, it's, it is certainly by government considered to be um, a positive action and, and uh, proactive instead of letting it continue to spread. Hello. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Um, question for you. Uh, can you please show me what your intentions are for the... Hi, hi. Is that better? Can you please show me what your intentions are for logging? Is it going to be clear cut? Or is the re respect for the, for the old growth trees? Um, what are we going to do with the road? Is it going to be open to recreation? What, um, can you give us an idea what, uh, as a person who's down below, I'd like to know what your intentions are. Okay. Uh, first of all, can you show me where you're going to, yeah. where, where are you going to log, how much you're going to log, and uh, how long is it going to be? Uh, I, I, I'll keep the talk to the school district and our, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll answer that in regards to the school district property okay. and our plans in there. And then the larger project uh, is another, another. Open house at another time. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. <laughs> so, so this meeting is only for the school district. Yeah, it is. Yeah. This is put okay. on by the board and, and we're invited to present our proposal. So regarding the school district and the school district 10 road, our proposal is to deactivate the road to limit public access across the school district lands. Um, that is our proposal. Um, this area to be harvested that would come down the school district 10 road, the road and can I move this? The, the road, there's a little bit of a bench of land right in here that the road will sit on. And um, from there, we'll have a, a, a tower machine that'll use overhead cable systems to bring the wood downhill. It'll bring the wood downhill to here and then uphill to there. It's very steep ground. It's yes. um, 50 to 70% uh, in grade. So it's quite we, steep. Uh, so, so like when you make the road, where, where, is, where is it going to come out? The road? The road itself, where is it going to come out? Where okay. is the school? So we're sitting going? here. Okay. On the school. This is the school district land. Right. This red line here is the existing Ruby Road that you've probably ridden your bike up yep. and down. Yeah. And then right here is our pro is our proposed road. It's the last. It's 200 meters approximately across the school district land. So, um, it's only above there. That's that's the only segment that we're asking permission to cross. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Hey. <laughs> yep. Hold it. You got to hold it because the mic's not going to be on. You're going to push the issue. Holy IT guy. Patrick, better watch out for his job there, Paul. A few minutes ago, you mentioned, you mentioned this, the this degree, of slope. degree of slope. Can you show us Can the, you show the us direction, of, direction the slope? of the slope? Please? Sure. Let me draw if I can. That's okay. That's okay. So, Chris, your question was uh, the degree of slope and the direction of slope. And you're talking just in the logging area? Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll generally, um, I'll do this. So this slope generally flows this way. 
Okay, and then it kind of starts turning like this. So if you go perpendicular, do you see these yellow lines through here? Those are the contour lines. They're lines of the same elevation. So if you go perpendicular from those, that's generally the, the, the slope angle, direction of slope, the aspect that we call it. So you can see that it's starting to turn a corner over here. If you can see that. So that's where I was trying to explain to Brenda where this water, these two streams up here, water courses, they go underground, they come above ground, they go underground. Um, and uh, let me, pardon me while I flip this stuff around here. Can I move this? I can move this. So they tend to flow away from from the school lands, they flow off the lands onto the BC Hydro lands um, in this general area. There is a stream of water course over here with this existing culvert on the Ruby Road. And it flows down onto the school district lands on the, on the northwest corner. So this is gentle grades down here, very steep across these rocky bits. And then it rolls over, it's concave, convex. And then it becomes concave through here and then steeper at the top again. Does that help? Excellent. With respect to the school district, where are we? Do 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 we, where are we at this point? Are you going to have this meeting and then we're going to vote, or what? What do you want to? What do you want to go? Where do you want? Where do you want to go with it? Chris, the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, right? Yeah. I believe we have. I believe we have. I don't remember what the closing date is, but several days, days, several days, who people to express express their concerns or their approval or their approval in writing in writing to SD ten SD ten. Terry, what's the website? Or who knows that's the website? Would the the they direct them to they direct them to me? So we'll be receiving so receiving input input. So up to, so, up to, so you're gonna leave it for what a month or so? I think it's ten days. Ten days. Is it not? Yeah, it's six days. But time in. Time in. So the question was, um, how much time uh, until the board makes a decision about allowing road access or not? And um, after this meeting where we've heard uh, people's questions and so on, there'll be an opportunity for anybody from the public to be able to submit to info at sd10.bc.ca any written comments. At that point, um, for six days, we'll, we'll have that open. It closes, I believe it is, on the 15th at noon. We'll collate all that information and prepare it for the board. There's a public meeting of the board on the 22nd of July. And at that point, the board will make a decision having reviewed all the documentation, information, plans, maps, and so on. Um, and, and that is a public meeting I believe it's at 7 p.m. on the 22nd of, of January or July, I mean. In, oh. <laughs> Take away oh, from Bob. Bob. I'm sorry. So, That's for you. Six days to, yeah. to make yeah. our. Yeah. A written, a written proposal or yes six days to make a written proposal and um people already had an opportunity uh from may uh un until now to also submit in in writing so we have received four submissions as well and the board has reviewed those but uh six additional days after tonight it's a bit uh, it's a bit six days is, is um, 
close. Let's close. Thank you. So what happens to your project if the board says no? Well, if the board says no to access, um, some considerations we have for harvesting or, or amending our shape, perhaps to take some of the wood uphill, um, perhaps, I don't think I can cable harvest it downhill. A helicopter is an option, a helicopter logging the timber. Um, nothing easy. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's how possible it is, so honestly. Will go ahead regardless. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not saying that. I will look because there's there's timber that is dying on the hillside. Uh, I will look again to see if I can come up with a plan that's that's safe, environmental, economical. Um, yeah, that's my job. It, it'll probably look different. Uh, it's a secondary question to my first question. <laughs> so um, you're counting on getting access in order for your project to go ahead. Like it sounds to me like if it doesn't, if you do not get authorization to cut through the 200 meters that it's gonna make your life quite a bit more difficult. So you're secretly hoping that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, it's it's a plan that I think is a, a good plan for this area. If that wasn't private land, that's where I would put a road across Crown land. Um, it, it affects this amount of wood right here in this color here. That's the timber that is really difficult to access from anywhere else because of the steep slopes, the, the terrain. Can I ask you a question? Do you have any data on how many lightning strikes you get in that area? That's, uh, that's, uh, there were 710,000 from the uh, over the last couple of days. Isn't that what I read in the news today? Not in Burton. Sorry, that's scary. I don't have that data, uh, but um, I don't remember it in here. But I know I know that there was a lightning strike last spring before I was on the hillside because I remember smelling the, the 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 smoke from that fire as I was walking. But, uh, just regarding any of the funds that would come in from this, uh, is are those funds made available to this school or do these go into like a general fund? A big pot of money for everyone. We can answer it. We can answer it together. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Peter and I will answer that question together. Um, that question has been discussed by the board. It would be a board decision about what to do with the funds, but certainly initial preliminary conversation is that it should go to benefit Burton School. It's here, so yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there to remind everybody that cutting down trees is actually not the only way to get rid of beetles as well. So if SD10 is worried about the beetles, we could totally like gather together traps, different options. So. Just remember that when making decisions. That is one of the strategies we're using to try to minimize the spread of the beetle is I've got traps out there. I lost one to a bear this past week. I don't know, it's, it's down, it's been chewed on, but like I said, I, I, over a liter of beetles that I caught, um, which is, it's impressive when you see it. It's a, it's a... Thank you. We just each have a microphone. 
Um, the, the understanding that I get from this conversation is that whether you get access from SD10 or not, the logging is gonna go ahead anyway. So whether we give access on the land and maybe if there's no access, it'll be more difficult to get that little chunk on the steep slope, but the rest of the logging is gonna go ahead anyway. So, uh, and, and the concerns about the, uh, the water sheds and the water intakes are not really affected by 200 meters of road. They're affected by the logging. So tonight's meeting, from what I gather, is do we give access on the SD10 property or not? Uh, all the concerns that have come up tonight are all excellent concerns as far as I'm concerned. But whether we give access or not, we're not going to change anything about the concerns that have been raised here tonight. Am I understanding this clearly or is it, am I in my bubble? Should I wear my mask? Is that steep is that section, steep the section coral colored one? Coral colored one. Will that still be that logged? Still be logged? If we do not, if give, we do access. not give access. Yeah, good question. So uh, portions of it will and portions of it won't uh, because um, we have a responsibility as the license holder to address forest health. If we don't do it, the government in past has told other companies to go in and log it uh, because they don't want the forest health concerns to exacerbate. That's happened in the past around the province. Um, so we wanna do it the way we think we should do it properly. Mm -hmm. So with our road from the north, this, this road that comes in up here at the north, that gives us access to basically all of that, roughly. Um, pretty good access, it's safe, it's, it's a, it'll be a solid road and good, good safe harvesting opportunity for this hill. This will all be cabled down. That hill is, is from about 10, 15% up to about 70% at the top. This area here, some of this could get taken up with that same harvester. It could park out here and take some of it up. So some of it will go up. This down here, I don't know how I'd log it. Uh, and if we don't log it, um, the beetle may spread. It may not. I don't know what the beetle's going to do next year. It is 95% Douglas fir. And there's a good chance it'll, it'll go through there. There's a little bit of blowdown in pockets in there. And that's where it seems to have bred up in. And it's spreading to the standing trees. So... So if we don't have access, we, we still will be doing some harvesting in that area. It'll probably look different than this shape. I'll have to modify that for, for a safe system, harvest systems, but there'll be something in there. That's our job. That's what we, that's our, our obligation under our forest license. Basically, giving the access or not is not changing, well, it's changing the plan a little bit, but I, I get the feeling from listening to the people is that there's hope in the air that if we don't give access, that it will stop the logging and it's not. So giving the access will simply simplify your life and probably make it easier to take care of the beetle, which is, seems to be the driving factor if we're not talking about the, well, the dollar value, but it, it seems to be the driving factor for wanting to log that spot. It's all there. about the beetle. <laughs> it, it is, is. it's okay. all about the spread of, well, it is, well, it's harvesting trees. It, it's a company, it's a, a profit, of course, that's, yeah. that's our business, but. Uh, our obligation is to address forest health concerns. If this was a patch of blowdown from a wind event, we would uh, try to go and harvest that properly, right? To recover that value. So I'm actually yeah. arguing. Your no, it's good. So I'm just trying to play the devil's advocate. Well, we won't, you know, 
you have a thought, Pat? Sorry. But, sorry, but, but you are correct. This is the best opportunity, the safest, most environmentally uh, uh, appropriate location. And Dave's put a lot of work into uh, you know, spending a lot of time up here to find the best spot. This is the best spot. It happened to be on School District 10 property, which is why we've approached them about access. Um, if, if the district says no, Dave will go back and look at it all. Um, this, is, this is the best one. Can you tell us you how tell much, how much, what kind of equipment you will be going across, across school, school property? School property? Uh, well, the phases would typically be um, there would be the falling of the trees, which uh, would be hand falling and or a feller buncher. And then this is to build the road. Uh, there would be an excavator and a bulldozer to build the road. Uh, then for the logging, there would be a combination of hand falling and feller buncher. A uh, feller buncher would do the lower angled slopes. And the hand faller would do the steeper angled slopes. Um, there'd be some ground skidding and there would be that tower cable system um, that uh, it's basically a big clothesline that with winches that uh, winch in the timber, raises it off the ground and drags it in. So there's no trailing of that nature, right? Less ground disturbance. The curves? Is that the question? Sorry. Yeah. So the trucks again. The plan is at the end of the SD10 road. There's a there's a level bench area, and that would be what we call the landing. That's where the trees are landed. They get processed there into log lengths that can be loaded onto a truck, and uh, the trucks would of course haul down and around and out. Um, and then there would be at that area is typically the branches, the bark, the broken pieces, the small tops, this slash that's left, it would get piled up and disposed of. And the crown will tell us that we have to do that in a timely manner because there'll be beetle in that. So we'll wanna burn that as soon as possible after, after harvesting, whenever it's safe to do that. Uh, the running surface of the road on the straights is somewhere around five or six meters wide, perhaps. Uh, through the corners, it'll widen out to maybe nine meters through the switchback. Switchback has about a 15 meter radius through the corner. It's engineered to safely take a truck. There'll be a ditch on the upside, on the uphill side, on the cut slope side. The ditch will be a meter wide and half a meter deep. Um, and there's, I think, four culverts on the map to go in that stretch to help get water, any surface water that, across. The right of way that we log is typically around 20 meters wide. Typically, it varies depending on what we need to do it. 20 meters, 66 feet. How big is this? How big is this? Width of the gym. This way. I would think maybe that way. I don't know. Yeah. We had a question. We had a question. Am I the one? I guess I'm the one. 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 Thank you for coming. For coming. For coming. And I, 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 I received a lot more clarity than I was speculating. Of course, my speculation is probably. I think the comment and comments on clearing things up and getting knocked out of the school district or the Board of Education can do their thinking. Their thinking. The input decision will be coming down soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.